folks, we'll, city. we'll go back as soon not, as the pandemic yeah. is, um, you know, is over. We'll go yeah, back. Yeah, great. Yeah, because yeah. you, have you seen your daughter at all? And she actually came down for a week about two weeks ago. You wouldn't believe what we went through to make it risk-free. Oh, I would believe it. You know, <laughs> you would believe it. Um, the the my uh, they have so, they, yesterday. They have so little um uh, covet up there yeah uh, but but she was she took a test before she actually drove 300 miles without stopping so she yeah. didn't have to use a bathroom or get gas yeah when she gave, got here she got here she stripped showered did everything like that and thank god it worked yeah it worked we were fine my so, grand yeah. my granddaughter yesterday said to my daughter uh, when we were in the backyard she said she calls me Bubby Tanta she said is Bubby Tanta in our pod yet <laughs> <laughs> that's cute oh. yeah so not yet in the pod but so yeah. we have to keep a lot of distance <laughs> yeah, but horrible yeah so it is time uh, I, yeah. I will recognize that today is Veterans Day and I know that among um, our congregation and among our Psalms class, we have people who are themselves veterans and who come from military families. I don't know if Dean Dresser is here. She is a veteran and also Tanya Domi is a veteran. Mm. Uh, and what? so just, you know, I think that we can study today in honor. I am study. I will Indeed. study today in honor of my father who was a Navy veteran, my uncles who all served in World War II, my mother who was a teacher on an Air Force base and my aunt. I was a, um, in the reserves for 10 years and I work at the VA hospital. So I wanted to put that then. My father was a vet and my uncle was a vet. May they rest in peace. Yeah. And my brother, my brother is a vet and my father was a vet. And my father-in-law was a vet. So we will turn so we it study over. today in all of their honor. I right, put it in the chat. You put it in the chat. Anybody you would like to make sure we're honoring today, their memories or their, or their names or any of you. And um, I'm a veteran of, and uh, Cantor Nimi will get us going. So good morning, everyone. Um, I, I read through Psalm 12, and so I'm not going to explain exactly uh, why, how this connects, because I, I, I don't want to preempt our, our reading the psalm in our conversation, but let's just say that when, when I read through the psalm, this piece of liturgy immediately came to mind, um, and perhaps that will become uh, evident as we study the psalm. Um, and maybe when I sing it at the end of class, it will resonate um, a little bit differently. But uh, <coughs> Elohai Nitzor coming from the end of the Amidah, um, uh, a prayer that comes that taken from the Talmud. Keep my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceit. And a setting by uh, by Rabbi Josh Warshawski, whom I've brought some melodies from uh, previously. Elohai nitzor b'shoni mera usvatai midaber mima Elohai nitzor b'shoni Usfatai midaber mima Min kalelai nafshi tidon Vinafshi keafa la kol tiye Ketaf libi betoratecha Utsvotecha tildof nafshi Tear 
نشانی میره از فتای میره به میمه الو هین سار نشانی میره از فتای میره به میمه Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kandor Nimi. So one thing that I did, I'm not sure if I mentioned yesterday, is that in the um, Alchet, in the, in the Vidui that we say on um, Yom Kippur, especially the long one, where it's Alchet Shechatanu Lefanecha, Alchet Shechatanu Lefanecha, that goes on, that's quite long. I've forgotten now, I have studied in detail, but the percentage of them that are about um, that are related to speech. It's really fascinating to look at the list and see how many are related to speech. And that is very much the theme of this Psalm, which we started to see yesterday and Kantronimi brought out by bringing us that particular, uh, and I've I never heard that setting, which I love very much. Um, uh, so let's go back to Psalm 12. And Psalm 12 really does focus on this issue of speech, which I think is really very important, not only for, well, let's look at the words. Let's go to the text. I think. Can we see it or no? Did we get through all of them or not yet? I can't remember what we, how far we got yesterday. Uh, no, we did not. No, we didn't. We know we did not. So let let's just read through in English up until I think we got up to uh, four, right? Or did we? I think we did. Well, yeah, we'll I think we did the first three. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, read it in English just to get us up to the, the verse, and then we can jump back in. So for the leader on the Shminit, a Psalm of David, help, O Lord, for the faithful are no more; the loyal have vanished from among men. Men speak lies to one another. Their speech is smooth. They talk with duplicity. Okay, so yes, we got up to four. Okay, so uh, uh, so do we have a Hebrew reader for this verse? Yeah, El is not here today. We will okay. uh, look for another Hebrew reader. Do we see someone raising their hand? I'm here. Okay, Ben will do it. Right. One at a time or the whole thing? Yeah, we did the whole thing yesterday, so let's just do one at a time. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Yachret Adonai kol siftei chalakot, lashon medabod gudolot. So the word karet, which was the chaf reish tet word, is a very, very complicated word. It looks simple. Um, it means to cut off or to cut, and it's used in biblical... Uh, um, context in a couple of different ways. Um, when somebody in in Jewish law is chaye, is it has it has, uh, receives karet as the result of behavior, it's the most severe um, response to negative behavior. So to, because, and there's a lot of discussion of why. What does cut off mean? Forget the, that cut off flattering lips, but even this word itself means to be cut off, uh, means that uh, you've done something that's extreme on the scale of bad things to do. We don't have time today to go into it, but it's an entire halachic category for all the list of things for which you are karate. Rabbi, is that what you did to Stephen Miller? Yeah, well, that was a that was a little bit of a conflation of cherem and karet. But yes, cherem is excommunication, and to be karet is to be cut off from from X, Y, or Z. Um, so it is a category. So this so the word means they think actually it's also used when um, um, treaties are signed. Uh, the the root of the word is used for various treaties are signed, and it might have might mean that when in the ancient world, when a treaty was signed, I'm not sure this is true. It's one of those things I've read about, but I'm not a scholar of this at all, that it might've been animals, like they, when they would do a treaty, 
an animal would be cut and divided between the, which kind of makes some sense, but so there's a sense that it's a very serious, this word is used in all these serious contexts. But here it is, yachret, now again, we'll notice here it's the verb, not may the Lord, that's how we would say it in English, but in Hebrew, this is the standard. Cut off, yud hey vav hey, kol sifte halakot, all the smooth, um, and I think we saw, uh, yeah, so all the smooth uh, lips or halakot here is interesting, uh, flattering. Lashon is a lip or it's also language or tongue. Lashon is a tongue. So midaberet, every gedolot who speaks gedolot. You see that's from the word of uh, Gimel Dalad Lamed for large, extreme, big, gadol, a very simple word on some levels, but arrogance here by meaning extreme, etc. Okay, so again, another sentence about speech. Korea. What's that? that? Korea. Is that Judy? When you rip your clothing in in morning. No, that's a different. That's with a, a the kuf as opposed to a kaf. Uh, but a good. That's a good good question. Excellent question. Sophisticated question. Is it the same? That's a hara. Say that again. Lashon hara. Lashon hara. Excellent. Lashon. Perfect. Lashon hara, which means gossip or evil speech. I like to think of lashon hara not being translated as gossip because I don't think gossip is always evil, but lashon hara is exactly evil, a tongue or evil speech. And, Maligning. Uh, um, Okay, let's go to five. We're going to get through a few verses, then I'll open it up for. And again, a share. Okay, Ben, would you read the Hebrew? So they say, okay, well, always the question is who's the speaker, who's being spoken about, who's the subject, who's the object. But for now, the simple, they say, our tongues, Nagbir. Galad, uh, Galad. <laughs> Gimel, this is early morning for me, folks. I just want to, Galad. Gimel bet resh is a word for, um, uh, it can be used to mean to overcome, to str it's strength, a, uh, uh, a hero is the, this is the root. It's a strong word, uh, to, but here it's to overcome, prevail, nagbir. But what will overcome? Tfatenu, our uh, lips, or here it's they're saying tongues, but it's so again, what we will overcome, so to speak, but by how will we overcome? With our our lips, our tongues, our here is our itano, mi adon lanu. Who adon, like the word adonai, aleph dalad nun is the shoresh, means. Uh, to be a master of, or to be, again, Adonai is my master, to be a master of us. So fascinating, right? So our tongue, somehow by our speech, our mouths, we will over, and then who would be our master? And again, the question is who's speaking? Who are they speaking about? Who are they speaking to? Always these are the questions that we have to be looking at. Okay, six, Ben. Uh, so we'll look more as we try and, and we'll look at some of the different translations struggle with this, but okay, misod anim, because of the uh, the evionim, uh, excuse me, because of the groans of the plundered poor and new needy, yomar adonai. Akum, ata akum. Now remember, we've seen the phrases uh, kuma Hashem. We've had a couple of verses that have started kuma Hashem. Get up, God. Uh, kuma Hashem is asking God to get up, to rise, to help us. Here, it's God saying ata now. This ata with the ayin means now. Akum, I will get up. So it's kind of a response to those kuma, yomar, yudhe, vavhe. 
I will give help Yesha, there's that root, Yud, Shin, Ayin, that Yehoshua, Yesho, Yesha, I will give help. Yafiach lo, he affirms to him or he, he reinforces to him or he, okay, seven. Amorot Adonai, Amorot Tehorot Kesef Tzaru, Be'alila Aretz, Mezukak Shivatayim. So we stay in the world of speech. So Amorot, the words, this is from the Hebrew, from Aleph Mem Resh, like Lemor, uh, um, the words of, or the speaking of, Yud Hei Vav Hei, and again, the word is repeated, are words tahorot that are pure. Tahor is means pure, like we have in the phrase lev tahor, uh, pure heart. Uh, so the words of yud hey vav hey, the words of the eternal, the world words of places of holiness, words that are from a place of the source of holiness, are pure words, are full of purity. Kesef, kesef. People know as the word for money, um, but it's uh, kesef means actually silver. But it's but when we talk about money or things of value, kesef saruf, silver purged in an earthen crucible, zukak shvatayim. Uh, I don't actually know zukak the word itself here. It's refined sevenfold shvatayim. You see the word for sheva, which is seven refined sevenfold. The number seven in Jewish tradition is a number of completion. It is a complete number. It is a number that indicates, um, so to say it's refined sevenfold is, uh, is an idiomatic way of saying it is complete, it is perfect. Eight. <laughs> You, now this ata is with an aleph. So as opposed to the ata with an ayin, which means now, ata with an aleph means you. You, yud hey vav hey, will protect them, guarding them midor, from this generation, le'olam, forever. Nine. Saviv reshaim yitalchun, u'zulut levnei adam. Saviv, that's to surround. Uh, a sivivon in Hebrew is the Hebrew word for dreidel because it turns around. But here, saviv rishaim, on every side or surrounding um, rishaim yital. This word is from the word holech to move around. So on every side, the evil will surround or move around when baseness is exalted. Kurum zulut livnei adam, when this negativity is exalted among human beings, bnei adam. Okay, that's we've done one run through. Let's take a few comments and questions. A lot of the questions we're going to hold as we look, until we look at some of the other ways that they're resolved because there are some interesting questions uh, and problematic uh, phrases here. Okay, so Harold, will, shall we? Let me unmute yourself. And I found out something that if you're on, uh, certainly on a Mac, if you're muted and you just press down on your space bar, you unmute yourself for the time you have your space bar down. Ah, and, that's uh, very yes, good. Yes, and then, um, and then you can uh, let, let up your space bar and you're muted again. Um, let's see, Carol Diamond on her phone has her hand up. Carol. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. The first uh, a pasuk, can I have it on the screen when they talk sure. about smooth talking? Sure. Hold on just one second. Thank you so much. There yeah. you go. Okay. And could you make it a little larger, Harold? Just so <laughs> Not really. Okay. This no, is okay. A, okay. Yeah, That's okay. Your phone, it's hard. So could you, uh, 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 Rabbi Kleinbaum, could you read it? Could you read it for me? Which I, first? Uh, the first verse. The first verse? 
Yeah, when he talks about smooth talking, okay, a smooth it gets talker. Repeated, right? So there's the word halak, it's three and four versus. Yeah, three okay. Four. Yeah. So but, men speak lies to one another. Their speech is smooth. They talk with duplicity. And the yeah. next sentence also says, May the Lord, may Yud Hevavhe cut off, and the same word is Yud, Chalakot Lashon. Right. Smooth. So there are such yeah. a, there's such a thing as smooth talkers in yes. daily parlance. We talk about yes. smooth talkers. And smooth talkers are usually schwitzels, you know, like yeah. they say in Israel. You know, Maret, they're just talking and they are boasting about themselves and telling you all these glorious things. And, and those of us who lived a long time recognize those people. So I think it's a really plain, wonderful translation of something that's going on today. Uh -huh. These are smooth talkers who just brag and boast and, uh, and schwitz. And uh, that's how I read the verse, you know. And, and they're all around Hebrew, us. Hebrew too, the word halakot does, a smooth talker doesn't have a positive. Uh, no, it's in a English. And it's true in the Hebrew too. It has a, has, that's it has not a like a little you, slimy, a little, you know, you know, it's not somebody who's not a. Hard. And I, I would like to ask you if you don't, you wouldn't mind sometimes letting me read in Hebrew. I would love to do that. Sure, absolutely. You know, because I could, I could Carol, be one of the Hebrew. Carol, you know, we will do that. Carol, we will do that, and also um, we encourage you to sign up for next for week, next week yeah. for the Psalms. Um, Rabbi, there has been a question going back and forth in chat about the difference between Amar and Diber, Omer versus Diber, Lemor, Daber, Amarot, Dibrot, the two words. Uh, yeah, there's a lot about that. I have to refresh my memory. There's a whole biblical, there's a very famous article. Let me read that article, find that article and read it and I'll talk about it tomorrow because I could, I, there's a lot of depth to that question that I can't grab into my mind right now. So let me come back to okay, it tomorrow. We'll make, we'll Unless make somebody better. else of our, but there's a lot said about that. That's a very, very, very important question. My 7 a.m. brain isn't there, okay. but I'll, I'll get there for tomorrow. Shep? But unless there are other people on the on the in the group that has it in your head, there's a lot written about that question. By the way, that's a big, big question. This is Naomi Hirsch, and I just want to say I'm the one who asked the question, and I'm much more familiar with the idea of Omer and Deber um, saying or speaking, perhaps. But I had not. I really the the word Omrot had never you know, leaked out, leapt out at me like it did today. Mm -hmm. The youth of that as opposed to Dibarim or Dibrot. You know, we say Aseret HaDibrot, the Ten Commandments. Um, that's why I asked the question. There's a, and there, there is a, it's a very important question and it, it's a very, it's, there's a theme of it throughout. So let me get back to folks on that. I just don't have I, it in my brain right now. I so understand 7 a.m. brain. It's not, <laughs> even my 10 a.m. brain is not so so great. So so thank you for offering to look for it tomorrow. I will. I'll I'll get I'll get I'll get back to the folks. Maybe we should have it's a coffee important. urn set up in the waiting room so people can get their coffee as they. I know I've only had one cup so far, and then we ran out of coffee. I mean, I don't have a really well stocked kitchen here yet. I only got one cup. So after this, I gotta get some. Go go to my next door daughter and son-in-law and get more coffee. Okay. Lisa Brown. No, you missed me. Oh, Shep, Shep I'm sorry, sorry. Shep, then Lisa. Okay, so my question is, Rabbi, how do we know when they're literally talking about lips and tongues, sefa and lashon, and not like language, because both those words also mean language. So cut off your lips, maybe it's cut off your language. I mean, how do we know? So as we look through not. the different translations, excellent question, Shep. As we look through the different translations, you'll see people uh, play with that differently. I think in this translation, they're just using, they're staying quite literal. But of course, when they're talking about lips and tongues, it's a reference to language. They're not be, uh, but it is a, it's a different poetic way of talking about language. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's, I don't think they're pretending it's not language. I think they're just not, but you'll see as people get there, this translator isn't trying to go for poetry. Um, and we know that throughout, uh, throughout the biblical uh, canon, we, we use these as their metaphors, but we don't always mean them literally. Okay, thank you. 
but we do know it's all related to speech. It's all different ways to talk about what we're, how we use our mouths to talk. And am I correct that Safat is also the beach? It's Safat Hayam. It's where Moshe stands with the uh, Israelites before crossing the Red Sea. Wow, that is really Hayam. interesting. I've yeah, it's like the whiff of the land. It's like the, yeah. the, it's really the land. It's really interesting. I've never river. thought about that connection. Is it spelled the same yeah. way? Yeah, it is. It's the same word. It means like the lip of the land, which it goes into the world. Wow, Harold and yeah. Shep, I've never made that connection yeah. before. That. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Now, poor Lisa. Lisa oh, Brown. I'm not poor. <laughs> but I was looking at um, verse 7. Um, and also, and it says, you know, Adonai Amarot harot. And usually, if there's an emphasis, that doubling of words is an emphasis. And I would expect the word pure to be emphasized, that the, that the words of the Lord are, are pure, are surely pure. But here the word, the word word is doubled and that gets the emphasis. So I, I was just wondering about that. I, I think, and we'll see, that's a very good question. You'll see different translators do different things with it. But I think it's saying, it's getting us back to that issue of words are at the core, right? And so the, they're saying not only, so, we have these. We have speech, which is evil in the mouths of evil people, and create terrible uh, all the different things. But I um, wrote Yud Hey Vav Hey, the words of Yud Hey Vav Hey of holiness. And again, we're not talking about a character of God. We're not talking about the the white guy with the beard speaking. We're talking about Yud Hey Vav Hey as the source of holiness, as the source of all that is good and just and right in the world. So this thing. So if I were to translate it. The language that comes from a place of holiness is a language of purity. So you need to say both in some ways. You're trying to say the constant is the language piece, but you're trying to say in contrast to what we've just been reading above, language and speech and words and communication that comes from a place of holiness, that is language and speech and communication that is pure. So that's why I think it reads that way. Aura? Yes, I was curious about the ending, the last two verses, yes. because I, I kind of expected it to end after eight. And then there was nine. And it kind uh -huh. of, you know, it kind of like unresolved my resolution. <laughs> well, isn't that true of life, huh? Just when you think you've figured it out, there's an unresolved thing that comes along and kicks you in the butt, right? Yeah, it does, it feels a little bit, <clears throat> and I'm sure there's a musical term for this, that you feel like eight has that resolution and then nine comes along with a little bit of a <clears throat> um, 14. What's that? It's 14, I mean, does it go on? It almost feels like it's starting something. No. Yeah. Nope, doesn't nope. look good. Um, all right, let's see, hold on, who, uh, Sherry Dratch, Sherry or Simon, I you never know. You know, I would, going back to Aura's point, I'd kind of say it's a little bit like, okay, we feel comforted, we feel a sense of, okay, we understand something, and then on nine, it's like, be careful, folks. Be careful, folks. Like, it's a little bit of a, ooh, it's not all taken care of. It's a little bit how I feel about this election. <laughs> Sh Sherry or Simon? Thanks, Or. Right. It's actually Sherry and Simon, but briefly, uh, in terms of verse seven, yeah, I'm thinking of the psalmist, and the psalmist in verse seven says seven, uses the word seven. Ah, which is isn't that interesting? I never noticed that. And the word word is doubled, and this is perfect and complete, and it just all seems the psalmist was mm. clearly making this a huge point, emphasizing this, Simon, thank you. Okay. And, Sarah, and, I've never made that connection. Wait, Sherry, could you say that again? I wanna make sure that I got that. Okay, verse seven. The Hold on, let me pull it up, let me pull it up. Yeah. Okay, verse seven. Verse seven. Ah. So you see, um, verse seven, seven. It has Shvatayim sevenfold. Right. The word for seven is in verse seven. Right. So I'm thinking of the psalmist and the emphasis the psalmist is giving to. Beautiful. The, the so emphasis. We have, yeah. We, and Harold, when we uh, complete a few more comments, do we have time to look at Levy today?
Yes, we'll we just did. Okay, great. So let's get a few more comments, then we'll look at leaving. So we'll, it'll be Linda, then so, Sarah, then Iris. Let me just make one more comment. Uh, Harold, let me just say one thing. Um, building on what Aura said, um, it seems to me that the last verse, you know, also was sort of jarring. It, it destroys the ark, which really had its fulcrum at six. It's almost as if that last verse belongs as, as verse three or four, uh, not at the end. Yeah. Um, and Rabbi, I understand your, your comment about it, but it just, it, it just feels wrong. Yeah, it's jarring, but maybe that's, maybe that's the point. But I agree, it's jarring, but maybe that's the, yeah. It, right. it creates a, a, yeah. Right, so Linda, then Sarah, then Ira, then we will go to the Levy translation. Linda? Yeah. Okay, Linda? yes, I'm, I'm unmuted. I'm having a lot of trouble with verse nine, as did Aura. Um, I, I'm looking at several uh, different uh, interpretations in English, and um, it, it's really uh, jarring in some ways, and I'm not sure what exactly it's supposed to say. It, it's not resonating with me with everything above it, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I'm understanding it because I don't read the Hebrew or... Um, if it's the interpretations, I'm not sure. It just doesn't resonate with me. It's not a language issue. It's jarring in the Hebrew too. The question is whether the, uh, let's, let's keep holding that as a problematic piece of the Psalm and we'll keep looking at other, at other ways that it gets resolved or not. Sometimes uh, things don't get resolved. Sarah Siegel. I, I think that this psalm feels to me, anyway, of all the 12 we've read so far, as extra gendered. I feel like there's extra um, mentions of uh, Ish and Adam, and so that's what struck me, and <clears throat> and I don't know if that's true. Um, no, I see you. No, wrong. and um, B'nai Adam is such a standard biblical way to talk about humanity yeah, that it's... I know, but Okay, so so yeah. I still pervert, I still twisted it to my own devices, and I just That's have to okay, say, which is there's nothing wrong with it. You're you, you, it's okay to be the person you are reacting to it. I don't think it's any more than another psalm, though. It's just because that for for the for the language of this period of the ancient Near East, B'nai Adam was as standard as you could get as a general reference to humanity. Okay, and just a final irony is that you know we talk about smooth talkers as being silver tongued. Ah, that's a very, and, and yet, go silver. Here it is, right? And here, though, he's contrast, the psalmist is contrasting that as, you know, God's words are pure like silver. Right, that's very interesting. Thanks. Ira? Yeah, I just have a quick a question about the use of the word midaberet in uh, verse four, which is the feminine, uh, uh, is it right? That's the feminine uh, word. So is, is that because Lashon is feminine? Correct. So it's Lashon Medaberet Kedolo? I just wasn't clear about why it was Right, feminine. exactly. Okay. You got Thanks. it. Okay. All right, and then um, one more Ben, and then we'll move on to Levi. I just want to go back to what Sherry said about seven in the seventh verse. It, Aren't the verses a later uh, invention? The numbering of them are, but the order of them are not. So this would have, yes, correct. The adding numbers and verse and chapter all throughout the Bible is a medieval uh, uh, addition, but it still would have been in the seventh place, so to speak. And the, you know what I mean? So I think it still stands, even if the number seven wasn't originally there. It's still the seventh line of this verse. Right, okay. But yes, the numbering of all the chapter and versing, that phrase, chapter and verse, comes from the medieval period. And it has a very interesting history, which would require a lot of other things. But the short version is that in the medieval period, the uh, rapidly anti-Semitic Christian Europe um, wanted to undermine the um, Jewish uh, textual basis and to prove the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament was wrong. They would have public uh, debates about the Bible and to, they would try and prove. And by the way, many of them who were doing it were Jews who had converted to Christianity. 
by the way, because who else would know so much about the Gemara and about Jewish texts? But in order to do these public, and there is a word for it that is not in my brain. Uh, disputations. Disputations. Thank you, Shep. See, it's, I love teaching by committee. It's great. Disputations. The Christians would say, what about chapter blah, blah, and verse blah, blah? And the Jews had never studied texts like that. But in order to be able to respond in these public disputations, they would be in the, in the, in the uh, squares of cities and towns. And they would get a scholar from the Jews to have uh, this debate with the Christian leadership. So Jews had to start adding chapters and verse so that they could respond. Because we never talked about, uh, as Ben is saying, we never would have said verse 7. And people would have been so familiar, they would have said, Tehillim... You know, and people would have, and we would talk about a Parsha. We would say Parsha Lech Lecha and refer to the beginning of a verse. So as a, so that was a medieval addition. And if we think of medieval times, you know, let's say 1300s, 1400s, that's already 1500 years, maybe even 2000, up to, I don't know, I'm bad at math. It's a long time since these things were written. So it's a good question, Ben, but I still think it's, it has power because it's still in the seventh place in this psalm. So shall we go to Levi? Rabbi? Yes, let's look at Levi. We're just gonna, and, uh, and again, we're going to Levi partly because Levi always, what I like about going to Levi as our second place or, or altar, I go back and forth between altar and Levi. You'll see why I wanna do Levi right now. Levi and altar are the two translations that we study, which use the architecture of the psalm. And so I think that's the next, it's, I like doing that before we go to those who uh, kind of ex explode the architecture or uh, relegate it to other priorities. So Levi, to remind everybody, is a rabbi, a contemporary rabbi, and he's looking for spiritual meaning, but he likes to stay close to the original text. In the Hebrew, he never writes out yud hey vav hey. He always says yud yud to replace, but whenever he writes yud yud, it's meaning yud hey vav hey. And he likes to stay to the architecture. So we'll see the seven, uh, we'll see the, what is it, nine verses. Uh, but let's just look at his translation, which I, I, I enjoy him a lot. I think he, he's, I, I love them all. And I really learn from all of them. So would somebody uh, who hasn't read, read the English once through of the Levy? All right, I'm looking for a hand, someone who has not yet read today or recently. A hand for an English reader. Lori Spear. Okay. For the director on the Sheminit, an eight string, a Psalm of David, emerge victorious, Adonai. Your covenantal followers are no more. The faithful have vanished from the human race. Falsehood, speak each person to another. Smooth words wash up on their lips. They speak first with one heart, then another. Adonai will dam up their smooth talking lips and their tongues that orate the grandiloquent speech. These are the ones who have proclaimed, we shall gain power through our tongue. Our lips are with us. Who could ever be our master? Amid the brute oppression of the poor, amid the groaning of the needing, now I shall arise, says Adonai. I shall rescue the ones whom they blew away, who the, whom they blow away. The words of Adonai are words uncorrupted, silver refined for the earth in a furnace, made pure, 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 pure. As for the oppressed, you Adonai will guard them. You will protect them from this generation forever. All around the wicked prowl up and down, so long as worthlessness is exalted among the human race. Very interesting, huh? So let's point out a couple of things. How are we doing Harold time-wise? Uh, good, we've got, we've got another good three or four minutes. Okay, so let me point out a couple of things and then we'll start with this tomorrow and uh, folks, read through this carefully, and we'll take comments on this tomorrow, okay? We'll go start with Levi tomorrow. So first of all, I love what he does. He uses the word shminit, 
but he also says an eight string. He does both. He says, we don't really know what it is. I always say they always use the Hebrew in the English when they don't know what it is, but he wants to emphasize that it's a stringed instrument. Um, so I like that. I love that. So notice what he does with the piece in the verse seven. Did folks notice that? So what does he do with the shivatayim? This, you see that? What he does, shivatayim, again, means refined from the earth. How pure is it? We, in the uh, safari, we saw it said uh, refined sevenfold. What does he do in his translation? He actually uses the word pure seven, seven times. times. So I think that's a very, I like that very much. I think he really emphasizes. And so sevenfold, it kind of goes, it, you know, it, it doesn't have power, but to say pure, 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 pure. I like that very much. This also he makes very clear by putting the uh, quotation marks, who is speaking when, right? So it helps a lot with that question that we had. I think is it verse uh, five, who is speaking? Because at first it's not clear to me who is speaking. Levy makes it clear, the what, who is speaking are, these are the, uh, for Levy, it's very clear. These are the ones who have proclaimed. Who are the ones? The ones that Adonai will dam up their smooth donkeys. So negative, the people who are evil are saying, we will get power through speech. Our lips are with us. Nobody is going to be able to control us if we control speech. And then, um, the next quote that Levi uses to clarify who's speaking in verse six, this is Adonai, amid the oppression of the poor, amid the groaning of the needy, I will rise, Ata'akum, I will rescue the ones whom they, meaning the speakers of five, blow away. Okay, so I think that's what we have. Um, how are you, can I keep going, Harold, or should we? Uh, well, there are a few things. One was the his use yeah. of yud yud instead of the tetragrammaton. So that's a convention uh, in the world of text when people don't want to refer to the use the full word, they use yud yud. That's a total convention in writing with the vowels underneath yud yud, the vowels that would be found in the word itself. So that's how it indicates that it's from the yud hey vav hey word, I don't know. But that's a totally, he didn't make this up, uh, but I just want, like people to notice it. Always look for the number of verses, the how language of God is used. But wherever yud, yud is used here, it means yud hey vav hey, as opposed to another name for God. And you'll notice in his English, uh, Levi doesn't want to, Levi leaves the word as Adonai, and that, uh, rather than a translation, but I don't know. Itself is a translation, right? I don't know. The right. word itself right. is a uh, stand-in. And Cantor Hirsch had pointed up in um, in chat that many times when we're reading sacred texts, we do not end an aliyah or a portion on a bad thought. Yes. We go back to a good thought, and that may be why a psalm that ends that seems to have resolved itself and then ends on a discordant note may be a little distressing to us. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Um, a few, one or two more questions. Sure. Um, Lori Spear, or was that was that your hand to speak, to read? Did you, did you have my another hand, comment? Both my hand to read. Okay. Uh, Cole Goldstein, Goodstein, did you want to have a comment? Okay, well, let me, Adria has not contributed yet today. So Adria, I know you have something to say. No, I just want to, I want the rabbi's opinion on why the word furnace was used in verse seven. Uh, let me find it. I don't know. Uh, well, I will, I will wonder say if he that, comments on it. Well, I will say that um, in ancient times, you know, they were refined, oftentimes um, refiners fire or silver that is refined. Silver comes up with dross. It's, it's, a, it's an ore and you have to melt it and then skim the dross off. And then you melt it again and skim the dross off. And then you melt it again and skim the dross off. So that's refined silver that is melted over and over and over again in a furnace. There you go. See, so that would be it. It's important and on to that, 
on that note. So folks, for tomorrow, we're going to look at Levy more. So look at Levy and look at some of the other translations and see what questions. Questions are good. Problematics are good. That's how we dive in. And uh, together, we'll, we'll figure out what it means to us. And start thinking about, um, if you were to write this psalm in your words, what would it look like? Again, don't sit down to write a grand work. Just try and say, what does this psalm mean to me? That's the place to start. But tomorrow and, we'll continue with Levy, and I think we'll go to Fisher if we have time also tomorrow. And just to remind people that we do lock the class at 10 after. If you arrive after 10 after, we will ask you to review the recording instead of being in class. We are still looking for Hebrew and English readers for next week's great read. I mean, there is a new email address that Annika set up that was in your email to submit 12 offerings. So please use that instead of the old email that you have for Annika. And with that, let me see, Cantor, we can go to, um, let's see, I will be pulling it up. Uh, you can start with that. So, and, I and Cantor, Nimi, do you want to say something now about why you chose what you chose or you think it's obvious? Um, I, I think now that we've really gotten through the whole <laughs> psalm and all of the text, yeah. it's, it's pretty clear. Also, I didn't go back and listen to class yesterday, so that... You may have already touched well, on it. I started, it but only only lightly. I started on it. Um, so yeah, but to take the, uh, I would be really surprised if um, uh, Marbre de Ravina didn't know Psalm 12 and perhaps have may have even been influenced by it when he wrote this particular prayer. Um, so, and to take it that and then to turn into the first person and to turn inward um, is definitely a direction that I have seen some folks in our class by changing an interpretation of a psalm for a personal kind of prayer. So what a wonderful thing to see precedent for that yeah. kind of practice. Shitidom, <laughs> Wow, thank you for that. And um, uh, so the room will stay open for five minutes for anybody who wants to stay in a little. It's wonderful to see everybody uh, and wonderful, wonderful to study with you. Thank you all so much. It's incredibly uplifting for me to study this with you every morning. Right, get your coffee, Rabbi. I'm going to get some more coffee. All right, great. <laughs> great. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. This is Dr. Hirsch. I'm sorry, I'm not usually visible for various reasons, but I just want to say that I have to agree with something Shep put in the chat. We are an awful lot of, I don't even need, awful, A-W-E, awful lot of very smart people in this class. Um, sometimes when I'm in the class, I think about the experiences I've had um, being the teacher in adult education classes and what it would be like to uh, have a class with as many people with so much background in so many different aspects of um, interpreting text and professional and personal experiences and how how rich it would be. It's truly like Pirkei Avot says more than from my 
teachers have I learned from my students and also how challenging it would be to stay on one's feet. It's, it's, you know, I, I enjoy this so much. It's such fantastic stimulation. Thank you, everyone. It, it is an absolutely wonderful class. And I mean, I'm new here and I feel like, you know, I haven't learned people's names yet, but I feel so intimately connected to so many people anyway, because of the level of discussion and the offerings. This, this, this one today, my problem in translating it is going to be that it, it's so, it feels so blatantly about what's going on with, with the national um, political scene. But that shouldn't be, it's, it's, it's Naomi again, it shouldn't be a problem, Joan, because that's exactly the point. These psalmists were writing about referring to things that were happening at the time and, and, and unloading their personal distress or personal joy and connection to what was happening. So it's, it's, I mean, I would, you could flip that and give thanks that the Psalm does speak to, I mean, not give thanks and that it's unfortunate that this kind of duplicity has to speak to us. But I mean, I, I'm not clear what you mean by having a problem translating it. It brings it to life so vibrantly. It is tremendously to life. I just don't know what I could add because it's so okay. clear already. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Hi, everybody. I'm going to get off. Thanks. It, I, uh, Naomi, that's wonderful. And, you know, I, it's just, it's, it was a wonderful class today. So tomorrow. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I got to go to work, too. <laughs>